Hello, and welcome to today's Channel Expert Hour webcast. I'm Jessica Davis, Editor-in-Chief of MSP Mentor, Contact Director at Penton Technology Group, and the moderator of today's event. And we've got a really interesting topic today, Replacing SharePoint, Redefining Collaboration Through Business Grade File Sync. Today's webcast is sponsored by eFolder. And before we get started, um, I want to first go over a few housekeeping items about how your webcast console works. I'd like to invite you to get social. Uh, you can use your console's widgets to do that. For instance, if you hear something interesting, feel free to tweet it out to your Twitter followers. Just click on the Twitter widget and your tweet will automatically include a link to the webcast. On the toolbar, you will see other icons. These icons let you control your webcast experience. For example, if you need to adjust your volume, just click on the media player icon and adjust the volume. Or you can resize or, or uh, move around your windows just to customize your console. So feel free to do that. And if any time you experience difficulties with slides, either advancing or audio troubles or something else, click on what we call the magic F5 key to reload your webinar console. And finally, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions during the webcast. We have a Q&A session at the end, but we also may address questions during the webcast itself. So you don't have to wait till the end to send yours in. Send them in as they occur to you. Okay, let's get started with today's topic, Replacing SharePoint, Redefining Collaboration Through Business Grade File Sync. Again, I'm Jessica Davis, your moderator for today, and here's what we'll cover. First of all, we're going to start out with some introductions. We'll meet today's speakers and learn about their areas of expertise. Then we'll talk about some SharePoint facts and realities. SharePoint, as you know, is a popular file sharing solution that has been around for a long time. We'll take a deeper dive into SharePoint's benefits and drawbacks and the market trends around SharePoint. And then we're going to take a look at some case studies brought to us by one of our guest speakers today, IT service provider Centrex IT. And then, of course, we'll have your questions throughout. So today we have two speakers who know a great deal about this topic. Ted Holsey, Vice President of Marketing at eFolder. Welcome, Ted. It's great to be here. Thank you. And Eric Rockwell, President and CIO of Centrex IT. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Jessica. And before we get started, Eric, can you tell us a little bit about your company, Centrex IT? Yeah, we've uh, been in business for 13 years. We work out of Southern California. We're headquartered in San Diego, California. And we specifically focus on regulated verticals like healthcare, biotech, and life science companies, and also financial services organizations, uh, defense contractors, and uh, in law firms. Those are. It sounds like those are com the kinds of companies that really need um, uh, uh, heavy focus on compliance and things like yeah. that. Um, secure, high, highly secure um, uh, systems to protect their data. Yeah, a lot of the life science companies we work with are publicly traded, so they go through annual SOX audits and have IT general controls that we have to be able to demonstrate in that audit. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Eric. Now, before we dive into the content for today, we've got a polling question for you, just to get a sense of your experience with SharePoint. So here's the question. What percentage of your clients are still using SharePoint? 0 to 25 percent? 26 to 50 percent? 51 to 75 percent? Or 76 to 100 percent? We'll go through that 20. one more time. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, what percentage of your clients in the audience are using SharePoint? Zero to 25 percent, 26 to 50 percent, 51 percent to 75 percent, or 76 to 100 percent? Okay, and now we have some results here. Um, zero to 25 percent, we have about 60 percent 
um, 26 to 50% uh, came in at 25%, and um, the other two percentages, uh, 10% and 5% respectively, about. Um, is this, Ted, I want to ask you, is this surprising to you, um, these results? Is this kind of what you expected? No, I, I think these are... These numbers probably reflect, uh, you know, the, the relative level of adoption of SharePoint um, and, you know, the, the use of SharePoint as kind of a practice area for a lot of partners. So I think these, num these numbers jive, I think, with what I would expect to see. Excellent. Okay. So let's move on now and talk a little bit more about SharePoint. Um, so we're talking today about replacing SharePoint, but, but let's start off by talking about what's good about SharePoint. I mean, there is a large install base out there. Um, so Ted, can you, can you address this? Uh, what, what, what is good about SharePoint? What are the benefits? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, at, at a foundational level, um, organizations of all sizes really need to improve levels of collaboration. I mean, I, I think no matter, um, you know, what kind of industry you're in, um, you know, dealing with content and, you know, workflows that require employees to collaborate with each other in a secure way is, is a challenge that every organization faces. And I think SharePoint um, was, was a pioneering um, solution in its day, I would say, um, because it really uh, came in with a, you know, um, an off-the-shelf way to, to build uh, internal um, intranets, as like we used to call them, and to really provide a framework for um, organizations to have a central repository that's authoritative for all of an organization's content, um, to organize it in a logical way, to have it be secure and centralized, um, and you know to have certain hooks into um, different Microsoft um, applications. So I, I think it's for a lot of organizations, it, it, it's done a good job. Of, of allowing employees and, and the organization to have an authoritative and canonical place to put content so that employees could internally collaborate. And I think if we go to the next slide, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Microsoft is, is, has built uh, SharePoint into a very sizable business. Um, you know, the, the numbers here, the revenue numbers we have here are a little dated, but um, in 2012 it was already a $2 billion uh, business for Microsoft. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 and I, I, it's, I don't think we note the statistic here on any of these slides, but at one point it was, you know, one of Microsoft's fastest, fastest growing uh, products because it was pretty much, it was quite ahead of its time um, uh, at one point um, in the sense that it was sure. solving a very, a very significant need in a lot of organizations. But by and large, I would say that the way it's been, it's, it's been architected and, and the way the, the bulk of the uh, revenue-producing deployments have gone out there, it's been more, I would say, mid-sized organizations and above um, right. have, have found success with SharePoint, but there's a lot of organizations that are smaller, that maybe have inadequate IT resources or maybe don't have the right, uh, maybe have a channel partner who, who maybe hasn't really perfected their practice area around SharePoint. Right, um, right. I think it's it's I've seen so many over my years of working at different companies and working with partners I've seen so many poor implementations of SharePoint um, because it's kind of one of those double-edged swords the the product historically has been fairly feature rich but with every button and knob and configuration option out there it's a potential source for additional complexity and sure, we all know sure. users and um, users want simplicity intuitive design, they want simple operation, and they want a solution that's really very much um, in tune with their the, the rapidly evolving workflow in, in a typical work environment today. So if you go to the next slide, I mean, I think the, the big challenge is there's a couple of mega trends that have really changed how employees want to work with content. Um, the whole bring your own device phenomenon the explosion of mobility and the need to work on content wherever you go, the ubiquity of uh, really uh, robust data services on smartphones makes it so that it's much more, we're, we're really in the mobile world today. And, um, you know, the legacy techniques of 
you know, secure remote access or VPNing into, um, you know, into a SharePoint portal. Um, if let's, you know, let's go back to that. Let's go back to slide twenty. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Jeff. I mean, I think the 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 reality okay. is is that I, I think organizations really have not kept up with the needs of users. Um, and I think if you talk to you know every frontline user who works at a company where that has a SharePoint portal today, I mean there's I mean these statistics in front of you come from the research we footnote from Redmond Channel Partner here, but you know 86% of business owners felt you know SharePoint failed to meet their expectations. And when you just talk to um, you know uh, rank and file employees, you know you say the word SharePoint and their eyes roll. I mean frankly, I mean in, in many cases, and, and that's a sad state of affairs. I mean it's. I worked at a company, you know, the company before where I worked. Uh, we SharePoint was our internal collaboration system, and it was inadequately uh, engineered and deployed. And, and we, as the marketing marketing department, were uh, frustrated because our, you know, our our job as marketeers was to put all this great content in front of our sales colleagues so that we could move the business ahead. And um, the salespeople simply just refused to use the portal. <laughs> right. So. Right. Um, and if so the that, users aren't using it, um, they're they're going to be looking for something else to use to share. Their right, files. and and SharePoint it, SharePoint's not cheap, uh, a and um, the real your real heart your real cost or your soft cost or your hidden cost is the degradation of productivity and collaboration in an organization. If your salespeople are suboptimized, if they can't get to the right marketing materials, if they can't effectively communicate with their prospects and uh, clients, then your sales are going to suffer. And that's really the hard, um, you know, the hard thing to quantify. And so we really, there's an opportunity to, to, to do something completely different. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, so slide 21, um, you know, I mean, the, the real why is this the case? I mean, I think, as I kind of already mentioned, I mean, the configurability of SharePoint is maybe one of its Achilles heels. Um, in, in a lot of deployments, you really needed an outside expert in many cases to do it correctly to kind of push the configuration complexity into the background by doing a, an elegant deployment, and that's often not the case. Um, and in, in our highly mobile, uh, mobile world, which is not, uh, let's just face it, it's not... It's not a Microsoft monopoly world anymore, right? We have a very diverse um, computing ecosystem where people are, are um, computing from a wide variety of different operating systems. Um, some organizations are rigorously standardized, but that's really not the norm today. Um, and in this more uh, open world, I think uh, SharePoint has not uh, really met all of the collaboration um, and content challenges of most users. Right, right. I, I, thinking about SharePoint, I mean, it's been around for a long time. It was it originally built for on-premise um, implementations. I can't even remember at this point. But. Yeah, I mean, at most. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely predates kind of our cloud-centric approach to things these days. And right. and you know, and most SharePoint deployments um, would be you know kind of trapped behind the firewall, if you will, and would require. Um, you know, users to VPN into the uh, into the corporation to get access to the content in a secure remote access fashion, which again is just not very mobile friendly. Um, and again, you know, people are in love with SharePoint about as much as they're in love with their IPsec VPN, which is not much. So, <laughs> um, and and that's kind of the that's the reality, and that's why um, you know I think there's for partners out there there's a huge business opportunity to. Um, deploy, uh, you know, next generation file sync and collaboration solutions that are that are not only elegant and easy for the user, but are secure and controllable and easily deployable by channel partners, MSPs, and solution providers. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Um, Moving on, we're going to be talking to Eric uh, about some of the uh, the client case studies that he's run into um, regarding SharePoint. But but first of all, Eric, I wanted to ask you, um, what do you see as kind of the biggest challenge with with SharePoint in your in your customer implementations, your customers that are still using it? Yeah, I think one of the one of the big challenges is just the lack of consistency. In the in the outcome of the SharePoint environment, 
uh, you know, Ted mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different uh, consultants and firms that uh, build uh, SharePoint uh, and, and do it, SharePoint implementations for uh, small and medium clients. Our client, uh, our target clients are definitely small to medium-sized businesses. And uh, even the uh, smaller ones that have uh, the right budget for the project, uh, they typically get an inconsistent experience with the result. And a lot of times I've seen that uh, the consultant who was doing the project didn't do a good job of defining the requirements going into it. They just kind of took an out-of-the-box approach. And at the end of the day, several key requirements were missed, and we had to find another solution that met them. That's got to be tricking tricky coming in after the fact and trying to figure it out as well. Absolutely, especially uh, since uh, we take a very holistic approach to managing IT. And uh, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we're accountable for everything IT, and, uh, and, and, and that would include uh, an on-premise or a cloud SharePoint implementation. Great. Okay. So let's dive right in, Eric, to some of these case studies that we're talking about today. Um, yes. The first one that you have on the list here is is biotech and life sciences. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Most of our clients, uh, you know, it's, it's a big vertical for us. Uh, we have a lot of uh, biotech and life science companies. Uh, a lot of them are publicly traded. Uh, mm-hmm. They, uh, you know, they, they they do everything from uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, to uh, uh, pharmaceutical research studies, uh, FDA uh, case trials, clinical trials and uh, also manufacturing medical devices. And, uh, and uh, like I said, a lot of these companies are publicly traded, so, uh, uh, so we have to be really good about defining our requirements and uh, providing documentation and evidence that uh, will show up in an FDA audit or a SOX audit or something like that on an annual basis. So, so at how ma- about how many customers would you say fall into that um that area of biotech and life sciences? About 20% of our uh, client base. Okay. And have you, have you migrated those clients from SharePoint uh, to the eFolder solution then? So, yeah, for, for most of those uh, clients we've rolled uh, the eFolder solution called Anchor out to them. Uh, and, and for some of them, it was because uh, they had a few requirements in SharePoint that uh, they thought the SharePoint implementation was going to meet, and it didn't meet them. And they still have, uh, you know, SharePoint online for, for different things, uh, workflow or document control. But uh, we had to deploy Anchor to uh, meet the additional requirements and, uh, and help get their mobile users, uh, you know, their sales force, uh, scientists uh, at, uh, at other uh, labs that they were outsourcing to, uh, really uh, be able to collaborate and uh, share documents uh, in the way that uh, that they have to work with them. The life science community is very uh, document-centric and big on document control. And uh, some of the features that uh, they thought they were getting from SharePoint, we were able to provide in Anchor, but uh, meet the additional requirements that they were missing. Excellent. And, and uh, those requirements, I, did, does, does the biotech and life sciences, does that fall into the compliance category as well? A- absolutely. I mean, uh, there's uh, most most of those uh, uh, clients have to adhere to uh, regulatory requirements like SOX or 21 CFR Part 11, and some right. of them have to adhere to HIPAA also because they're uh, working with uh, with live patient data. Okay, excellent. And um, Ed, were there any concerns that that SharePoint was um, uh, the tried and true solution? Um, did you have to overcome any obstacles um, in proving the compliance um, of Anchor to your customers? Not, uh, not from a compliance perspective. Uh, we uh, were actually uh, uh, hosting the, uh, the Anchor servers in our private cloud, and uh, we went with that strategy so that uh, we could uh, fully demonstrate uh, some of the compliance requirements uh, that we have. And uh, that works. Uh, that works well with the model that uh, we're uh, we're delivering to our clients, especially these uh, heavily regulated life science companies. And uh, some of them had existing uh, SharePoint implementations, like I said, that were uh, missing requirements that they had. <laughs> and others, uh, we went through a process to define the requirements and realized that uh, Anchor could meet all of the requirements they had, and we didn't really need to. 
uh, go through a complex, time-consuming SharePoint implementation. Uh, so it was much easier to get them up and running and meet those requirements uh, and uh, and do it do it quickly, which I think is an expectation that's been coming from this whole shift to the cloud. IT should right. be less complex and uh, take less time to do properly. Any any uh, ballpark estimates of how much faster it was, these implementations? Well, uh, yeah, typical uh, life science SharePoint implementation is 6 to 12 months. Wow. That's a long time. It, it is a long time, and there's a lot of uh, documentation, validation, and qualification that has to go along with it. And uh, the the information qualification and operational qualifications for uh, for deploying Anchor are are very straightforward because it doesn't do everything like SharePoint does. So we don't have to go through this this really extensive validation process. It's much easier uh, to go through in the life science community than SharePoint. Okay, and and how fast was the uh, Anchor implementation? Most of those implementations are uh, three to four weeks including uh, training. Yeah, yeah, because we have to create the work instructions uh, and, and things like that and training records uh, for their team so that during an audit uh, we can actually demonstrate that their team was properly trained on, on how to use the system. Excellent. Great. Thanks. And so let's move on to the next case study, um, defense contractors. So what are the special client requirements for defense contractors? A lot of the defense contractors that we work with uh, actually uh, manufacture uh, top secret uh, military uh, technology, and uh, and they have to adhere to a compliance requirement uh, called ITAR. And one of the uh, ITAR requirements that we have to be able to demonstrate is that uh, none of the data left the United States, and the data was only accessed from uh, from uh, uh, validated users inside of the United States. Wow, that sounds, big, that, uh, that sounds tricky to be able to guarantee that kind of thing. So, so how were you able to um, uh, make sure that happened for them? There's a couple uh, pieces to that, re that recipe. Uh, there's the documentation and the training side so that we can demonstrate that everyone's been trained on how to access and handle ITAR-regulated documents and what they are. There, uh, there was the anchor piece so that uh, we, have, uh, we have all those documents only accessible from approved devices and approved users and something that we can demonstrate. And we store them encrypted. It's encrypted at rest and in transit, which is another ITAR requirement. And uh, the final one was uh, uh, just using uh, laptop encryption technology and setting up a geofence around the United States so that if uh, a, a rogue user, uh, you know, uh, left the country with, uh, with a, a laptop that had ITAR-regulated data on it, it would remotely wipe, and they wouldn't lose any data because we're using Anchor to sync it all back to their centralized uh, cloud environment. Wow. Is that kind of a geofencing technology that, that you're, you're doing with that? Yeah, we're using a technology uh, uh, called CompuTrace for the, for the geofencing. Nice, nice. Can you guys, can, Eric, can you kind of dig in and like explain geofencing a little more, like just for the layman, in layman's terms, how it works? <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's a, there's a chip that comes in all the, uh, the business grade uh, Lenovo, Dell, and HP laptops, and we're pretty heavily standardized on uh, Lenovo ThinkPads. And, uh, and uh, the chip is specifically for CompuTrace. When we activate it, uh, we can geolocate and geotrack that device. It's kind of like find my iPhone. And uh, uh, that way we can uh, produce evidence that the devices were only in a certain area. And we can program it so that if the device goes uh, to a GPS coordinate that's outside of uh, the U.S. borders, it will uh, perform some action such as automatically lock, uh, uh, email or knock, or uh, completely remote wipe. So Very geofence cool. is just, uh, yeah, it's an electronic border around the United States, and uh, just like uh, if you had uh, Find My iPhone locating, say, your iPhone, CompuTrace is locating all these laptops, and we have a program to perform certain behavior like remote wipe if it goes outside of that electronic border. Makes sense, makes sense. And um, ha have, have any customers used 
uh, implemented that yet? Have they have they had occasion to use that, or is it really a safety thing so far? From the defense contractors, it's been a safety thing. We we've, we've never had to execute it, but uh, we've had to execute that uh, for a number of other healthcare and life science companies uh, uh -huh. uh, where where a user uh, lost their laptop, and we had to remote wipe it and keep that remote wipe certification from the device on file just in case uh, it comes up at the finding in a SOX audit or a, an FDA audit or a, or a HIPAA audit. That's how we demonstrate that uh, their laptop uh, uh, was encrypted and had, uh, p you know, let's say uh, some sort of PHI on it or some sort of uh, life science uh, regulated data. And, uh, and that's how we can demonstrate that that data was, was uh, securely uh, removed. Excellent. And, and about how many, um, do you work with a lot of defense contractors, Eric? Yeah, that's about 10% of our client base. There's a lot of defense contractors here in San Diego, uh, and, and a lot of them have uh, small margins, and uh, uh, we need to find solutions that meet their budget requirements as well as their technical and uh, compliance requirements. Has uh, the anchor solution, um, has the, the uh, cost been a selling point for the anchor solution with these types of customers? It, it absolutely has. I mean, there's a very low barrier to entry. We charge per user per month, so the pricing uh, for Anchor is very simple and straightforward, and uh, and it's always uh, it's always been able to fit into the budget requirements uh, of that vertical for the clients that we work with. Very good. Okay. Um, anything else you wanted to say about the defense contractors before we move on to the next one? No, are there any uh, are there any uh, questions uh, chat questions from the group? Let's see. Um, not on the defense contractors per se. We do have quite a few questions here. Um, uh, uh, but but I'm going to hold on to those for just a minute, and we'll move on to the next slide to talk about the outpatient medical groups. Um, what, uh, what, do these um, particular clients have specific requirements, and uh, what are those? Yeah, it's about 35% of uh, the clients that we work with, and some of them are very large uh, outpatient groups with 50-plus locations. They all have HIPAA and PCI requirements because they house an enormous amount of protected health information electronically, and they process all of their... Uh, credit card payments for things like co-pays and visits electronically. And uh, right now HIPAA is, uh, is not as tightly controlled as, uh, as say, Fox, for example, where you have a third-party firm performing an in-depth audit that's publicly available on an annual basis. Um, I think it will get to that point uh, at some point in the future. But right now, uh, you know, the HIPAA requirements uh, are, are somewhat loosely defined and the audits are, are not done on a regular basis. They're usually done because a patient or a disgruntled employee uh, called and reported them to, uh, uh, to CMS. Okay. Uh, and, and you said that was about 35% of your customers. Is, that, is this a growing um, area? It, it absolutely is. Uh, one of the trends that we've seen in, uh, in San Diego is that uh, the larger uh, outpatient groups that we work with uh, that specialize in something like cardiology or nephrology or urology, uh, they're growing through acquisition. And it's, uh, it, you know, the, the cost model really doesn't make sense for a single physician uh, uh, to be able to uh, uh, just afford all of these massive IT expenses, having an electronic health record system, being able to demonstrate HIPAA compliance, uh, the, the, the cost and complexity is so high for a single physician, so uh, it makes sense for them to sell their practice to a larger group and, uh, and benefit in the profit sharing of that larger group because there's just so much scalability and efficiency created and than it does for them to uh, operate their own practice, their own business, and, uh, and, and, and collect the profits that way. It's not as profitable as it used to be. So we have a lot of groups that are growing through acquisition, and we had to be able to design a system for them that could not only scale but assimilate any group uh, that they that they purchase and onboard them 
and you know completely assimilate their environment within 90 days. So are you migrating a lot of these customers from legacy uh, solutions to the anchor solution um, as they acquire uh, other practices? Yeah, 100%. We have, uh, we have very, uh, very good standards documented uh, and defined for, uh, for, the, for the groups like that. And uh, when, we, when we come in uh, to, uh, to a group they're purchasing, it's just like we're onboarding a new client. We, we do a, a risk assessment. Uh, we assess everything against the group's uh, uh, IT security policy, information security policy, and uh, we, we roadmap them towards the group standards. Uh, just like we were onboarding a new client, and it usually takes about uh, about 90 days. An acre is one of the standards. Are are the cost concerns um, at, at the top of the list with this group of uh, clients as well, or is that less important? Yeah, you know what, uh, it, it is it is definitely important. Uh, you know, there 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 is still uh, you know I I can't uh, I can't lie. There is still a a good margin. Uh, for a lot of these groups, when they get to a certain size, uh, and, and they're doing quite well, but uh, Medicare is changing the way they reimburse uh, physicians and groups, and uh, and it's becoming more and more uh, important for them to have uh, expenses like this in it, uh, that are that are under control instead of uh, uh, you know instead of how they they kind of used to plan and budget, which was not budgeting, just uh, spending uh, whenever they thought they needed to. Right. Less, right. Uh, less controlled. And, and I see here um, on the bullet points here, we're talking about secure sharing with a transcriptionist. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a unique uh, uh, requirement that a lot of uh, outpatient groups have. Uh, a lot of them, even the larger ones, don't have an in-house transcription team where uh, uh, you know, a person is listening to a recording <laughs> that the doctor made. And uh, and typing that recording uh, into a document, and because uh, most of those transcriptionists are not in house, they're working remotely from their home, <clears throat> and uh, that means that they, in many cases, have PHI unencrypted sitting on their home computer. Wow, that's got to be a big security concern. It's a huge security concern. Uh, you know, medical records are uh, pretty valuable. On, on the open, uh, you know, on the, on the black market. Uh, you know, you can buy credit card information and social security numbers for about $4 uh, a, a person, and you can, and whereas a medical record would cost 40 to 50 a person. Wow. And so how does the uh, Anchor Solution work to ensure the security of these uh, transcriptions? Same thing. Uh, we're able to uh, come in uh, with... Uh, uh, with with a a process and uh, uh, and that process includes having all of these documents only stored on Anchor, so it's encrypted, um, and that uh, we only give the transcriptionists access from approved devices that we've already documented meet certain requirements like encryption, uh, antivirus, and security. Okay, great. But it's great for these groups because uh, for a fairly low cost. They can outsource something like uh, transcription that's critical uh, to their patient care process, but not have the security risks and vulnerabilities that typically come along with it. And a lot of the how patient groups that we that we talked to in uh, our sales process had no idea that that vulnerability even existed, and it's extremely common. Wow! So they're getting protection that they didn't even know they needed. And um, exactly, and it, it, things could have been going wrong, but now they're not going to. Um, that's great. And then, and, and then, and mobile yeah. device. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that there's not going to be a breach, but it means that if and when there is a breach, we have all the evidence and documentation showing that we were going above and beyond to protect that data, and right. it's far less likely that they're going to be held liable for the breach. That's great. And then um, mobile device access. Um, uh, outpatient medical groups, this is a concern for them? Absolutely. Yeah, so a lot of... Uh, yeah, I was going to say, a lot, of, uh, yeah, a lot of physicians uh, love using their iPhones and iPads. Uh, uh, some, some EMRs have a... Some electronic medical record systems have a pretty good uh, iPad interface. 
most do not, and uh, and uh, a lot of them are just extremely cumbersome and frustrating to use. So, uh, a lot of our do our doctors will view uh, documents like uh, medical history reports uh, through an anchor portal on their iPad. And it's secure um, that way via the anchor platform. Yeah. Yeah, it's secure, and, uh, and we can demonstrate during an audit that uh, those sessions were encrypted and that they only had access from certain devices, and if that device is lost or stolen, we can remote wipe it. Right. We can actually, with, with the, uh, the built-in anchor features, we can automatically pull that data off of uh, their iPad without remote wiping the entire iPad, which is great. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and a lot of times uh, uh, the larger out outpatient groups uh, work with healthcare consultants, and uh, they share data electronically with these consultants, and they're looking for ways to increase, uh, increase efficiency by uh, changing the way they order things like cotton swabs and uh, medical devices. But the consultants ask for a, a, usually a raw dump from their uh, EMR uh, database, and it goes into a spreadsheet that's not encrypted. And uh, you know, a lot of times, again, that just ends up on a consultant's laptop, which is not encrypted. And uh, if that laptop gets breached, uh, all of their, uh, of their patient records uh, become compromised. Oh, that's so like a use, nightmare. Yeah. Oh, oh it absolutely is. Uh, every, every year, these you know, the, uh, breaches that are uh, more than 500 patients uh, have to get reported, uh, and, and they're publicly available on uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, website. And uh, if, you, if you go through them and read them, you'll see, uh, you know, you can kind of put the story together behind how those breaches happened. And a lot of them are just from uh, uh, simple things like that, uh, spreadsheets containing 10,000 patients, uh, a PHI getting emailed that's not encrypted. And by the way, that's another uh, great use for uh, for the anchor portal that we found with the outpatient groups. Uh, mm -hmm. They can actually, if they need to email something, uh, they can just uh, send a link through uh, anchor, and uh, that way they're just clicking on on a link to the encrypted website, and no data actually gets sent uh, through the email. Okay. Great. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, market vertical here, uh, talking about uh, CPA firms. Um, as we get closer yeah. to April 15th, I know we're all thinking about CPA firms. Um, what are the client requirements for this type of customer? In, in, in pertaining to, to Anchor, uh, one of the things that we found with CPA firms is they, uh, they all want to uh, – they all want to and do share data with their clients, like uh, copies of tax returns, and they typically just uh, PDF it. Sometimes they'll password protect it, and sometimes they won't. And usually they'll just email that, uh, that PDF uh, to someone's Hotmail or Yahoo account, and they don't think twice about it. Uh, but again, that has a lot of uh, personal uh, protected information inside of uh, that document because it is a tax return. And uh, there were tens of thousands of uh, fraud cases this last year in 2014 where uh, hackers compromised uh, data from CPAs. And at the very beginning of tax season, they filed bogus tax returns for all of uh, their clients that they gained access to. Had those uh, tax returns sent you know, to some, uh, some bogus uh, location. And by the time that person actually filed their return, the government said, nope, you already filed, sorry. Wow. That's, and a lot that's of it, uh, frightening. Right. Yeah, and a lot of it comes from really, really good CPAs that are somewhat old school and just aren't aware uh, that, they're, that they're putting their clients at risk. And, and uh, we work with a lot of CPA firms who uh, are very committed to their, uh, their clients' uh, privacy and security. And a very common requirement from them is having an easy-to-use web portal where their clients can log in and download information uh, like their tax returns securely and electronically, and uh, that's something that we've been able to accomplish using Anchor without having to deploy a full, complex uh, SharePoint uh, implementation. Gotcha. And so, uh, you know, you bring up SharePoint again, and I've got to ask you, uh, 
Does SharePoint not satisfy um, these, these client requirements? Um, how does it stack up in that way? Yeah, a lot of times uh, yeah, SharePoint uh, won't fall into the budget uh, requirement just because it is, uh, it is so big and complex and does so much. Uh, you, you know, usually when we do see uh, SharePoint implementations in one of these ver verticals, they're to accomplish something like uh, a document control process. But uh, uh, a lot of times the basic requirements include encryption and, uh, and secure file sharing. Or uh, uh, a lot of these companies have a requirement to, uh, to basically mirror their existing file server infrastructure uh, because it's fairly mature and, uh, and give outside parties access to that. And it is possible to do that with SharePoint, but it's kind of cumbersome and, uh, and, and, and costly compared to deploying something like Anchor and accomplishing those same requirements very quickly. Hmm, makes sense. Yeah, and another, another requirement a lot of these companies have is offline access to files that are on their file server. And again, you can do that uh, through offline file sharing and other methods, but it is uh, cumbersome and uh, you know, we found it to be uh, uh, somewhat unreliable. And uh, people, a lot of these guys just want the file sharing to be secure, they want it to be easy, they want it to be simple, and they want it to be scalable. And uh, we found that, it, that uh, we can accomplish those requirements much better uh, using, using Anchor. Hey, Eric, I have a question coming in from uh, Patrick. Um, he wants to know, he, here's what he says, one of our clients uses SharePoint for document workflow, uh, for instance, email notifications when a document is ready for review by the next person. Are there ways to replicate this with something like Anchor? There are ways to replicate uh, very basic uh, workflow rules. Uh, anytime we have a client that has uh, more advanced uh, workflow requirements, uh, we usually do go the SharePoint route. But uh, there are basic uh, workflow requirements that you can meet with uh, with Anchor. And I'm sure that the, the costs are probably lower as well um, with Anchor as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's more of a uh, you know it's more of a this is the product and here are all the features and they're very focused around. Uh, file sharing and file synchronization, which is which is great, and it uh, it's not as customizable as something like SharePoint, but uh, in in a lot of cases for file sync and file sharing, you don't need it to be. It's probably it's it's easier to use as well. Um, I would imagine. Yeah, easier to use because it uh, yeah because its scope is uh, quite a bit smaller and and right. much more focused. Excellent. Okay. And um, let's see. So did we go over all these requirements? Um, uh, it, we're talking about the CPA firms again. So um, we talked about the ability to cloud enable the file server, um, secure sharing of tax information with clients, and alternative to email or using PDF password. Um, yeah. Have you have you migrated many of your customers from other solutions to Anchor in this particular vertical? We've migrated uh, other companies from uh, you know from uh, uh, custom Dropbox and Box implementations to Anchor. That's uh, fairly common. And uh, a lot of times we'll find that uh, maybe the sales uh, team, you know, they set up their own thing in Dropbox, and uh, you know before you know it. Like uh, for uh, for a defense contractor, um, ITAR regulated data ended up in there. We found it during one of our audits, and uh, and then we were able to uh, remove that custom solution and get them standardized on something like Anchor that still met the compliance requirements. Very good. Okay. Um, and so let's uh, talk a little bit about emerging client requirements. Um, so so the the question is, how does eFolder Anchor satisfy all these emerging requirements? And uh, so the first one is secure and intuitive business grade file sync. Um, Eric, can you speak to that for us? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think Anchor uh, and eFolder will need to continue to evolve the uh, the security behind Anchor to keep up with uh, you know changes in the cybersecurity world. Uh, I think the encryption needs to continually uh, uh, get stronger, and uh, and uh, if uh, you know, just in terms of feature requests uh, for security, uh, we at some point 
for uh, for life science uh, clients who have existing validated file sharing environments, uh, we need to be able to mirror Active uh, Directory security groups uh, with uh, with Anchor. Right now, Anchor is Active Directory integrated, which is awesome, but we have to duplicate the security groups uh, inside of Anchor. They don't uh, they don't translate from Active Directory, and in a in a validation uh, process or an audit, that ends up uh, creating creating a lot more work because you have to uh, validate two different systems. Okay. And, and um, I've talked to the uh, Anchor guys uh, uh, a lot about that. And I know it's something that that's on the roadmap and and will be available at some point, but I don't think they have a commitment on the on the date. Okay, it sounds like they're working on it though. And yeah. then certainly we talked a lot about uh, compliant service for sensitive verticals, um, and and yeah. all the verticals you talked about today seemed like they were sensitive, um, from the defense contractors to the yeah. uh, the medical groups. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I don't think. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say I don't think uh, Anchor really, uh, uh, you know, originally uh, uh, decided to target uh, 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 companies that had regulatory compliance requirements, but uh, it fits, uh, you know, it fits those requirements so well. I think that uh, Anchor has uh, a huge opportunity to uh, to actually go through uh, some of those types of uh, audits and uh, you know audit and certification processes themselves so that smaller uh, managed service providers who don't have an SSA 16 uh, certification or something like that can just say, uh, we've got all of our uh, control documents uh, centralized in Anchor. Here's their SSA 16 report, and uh, here's how we meet all of, uh, all of these different uh, compliance requirements. Right. And then, of course, there's the ability to cloud-enable the file server, which is which is huge these days. Uh, everybody wants to it put is. everything in the cloud. Um, everybody wants to collaborate. Um, is that a yeah, big and, requirement? And people, huge, huge requirement, especially for it, not so much for uh, uh, you know uh, scientists or uh, uh, engineers, but much more for uh, like the sales team uh, of a defense contractor or or a life science company or a pharma company. Uh, you know, look, those guys are flying all over the world, and uh, they want to have access to everything, usually offline. But if their uh, computer gets lost, uh, you know, right now we're using Anchor to synchronize all of their data back to the centralized uh, file sharing environment, their, their uh, corporate file servers. So uh, that's another thing that Anchor does extremely well, and uh, and that uh, that need is just increasing with the amount of uh, road warriors that these types of companies are hiring. Right. And then um, encryption in transit and at rest, um, it's all about data protection too if we're talking Huge. about the cloud. Um, Absolutely. So with your, especially with your sensitive verticals, um, this is a big requirement? Huge requirement, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, uh, uh, you know, right now when we have to uh, demonstrate total encryption, uh, we have to, we have to encrypt the endpoints like the uh, the laptops or the mobile devices. I think a, a great future feature uh, for Anchor would be to be able to uh, encrypt the data at rest on, say, a laptop, so that we can that we could demonstrate that uh, that the regulated data was always encrypted at rest on the on the mobile device without having to uh, do a full hardware encryption on the laptop. That would hmm. be huge. Okay, and then. Uh, uh, finally, secure third-party sharing guest accounts. Um, you want to extend some things um, to maybe you have contractors, maybe there are oh, yeah. uh, patients. Um, so that, so that, tell me a huge. little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's huge. I mean, uh, a lot of our clients will uh, uh, have a, a share on their file server that uh, lots of people uh, internally use, and they'll basically cloud enable that so that a a company that they're working with on on a project, uh, they can access those documents just like it's uh, uh, a part of their own their own network. So it makes uh, the file sharing and collaboration really simple, really easy, and also secure. I think that's a that's a great feature. We also have uh, a lot of users that uh, will email documents to someone through Anchor and configure them to expire, at, you know, after a period of time like 24 hours, so they don't have to worry about that uh, document just lingering out there in the cloud forever. Hmm. 
That sounds like a great advantage. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, pricing for profits here. Um, yeah. We have a slide here. I, I don't know if you can see it, but, but it talks about what kind of margin that you are seeing, what kind of growth margin you're seeing on um, uh, eFolder Anchor. And we have a number here that's big. It's 55% um, plus. Uh, can you talk yeah. about um, – yeah. Yeah, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this with uh, Ted on the line because we have a uh, pretty good price <laughs> already. But, uh, yeah, I mean, on, on our Anchor uh, users, we're getting about a 72% uh, gross margin, and that includes, uh, you know, the cost we pay for the license and our encrypted storage uh, costs uh, in our private cloud, which is all uh, SAN-based uh, storage that we own and uh, operate. Nice, nice. Okay. Thanks for that uh, margin information. And um, I wanted to uh, kick it back over to you, Ted, for a minute. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the – can you talk to this slide, choosing products and vendors? Yeah, I mean, I just I – mean, we're, we're getting here to the uh, the end. Uh, just keep the questions coming in, everybody. Uh, just, but just to kind of, uh, you know, kind of round out the conversation, um, I mean, one of the really unique um, – benefits of the Anchor product line for MSPs is that we, we designed this solution for managed service providers and VARs, really from the ground up. And so um, it's got a host of different features um, that are really designed, uh, features like multi-tenant management, really strict security controls as Eric reviewed in these different vertical use cases um, that are specifically designed for deployment by managed service providers. But there's a whole host of other things about just how we do business as a company that really supports the uh, managed service provider business model. We only take this product to market through our channel partners, um, specifically, in most cases, managed service providers. Um, we provide you a we, – we market the product and offer it with a low wholesale price point, which allows you, with abundant storage – which allows you then to package it in your own um, own service offering. Um, you know, in, ca in the case of Eric's firm, they are licensing the product as a private cloud deployment. So that means that they are provisioning their own storage um, and 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 running the product in their own colo. But um, the vast majority of eFolder partners today uh, do license what we call our SaaS version of the product. So that's where we combine the software functionality with the cloud storage. And today we include uh, 100 gigabytes per user per month um, with the wholesale fee. And then once you get onboarded, um, you're able to, you know, brand the product um, with your own name and your own logo, your own naming conventions. You're even able to brand it in many cases down to the client level if you have large clients who want to have their own name on it. And we support you kind of every step of the way with an account manager with very effective onboarding on the sales and marketing front. So everything really to make you successful, to be able to go out there and uh, bake this into your overall service offering and drive recurring revenue and serve the really complex and unique requirements of your clients. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, I understand that there's a free trial available if, if uh, anyone wants to, to check this out. Um, can you yeah, tell us so we, about that, Ted? We, yeah, so we, I mean, we recommend every partner who's interested in, in evaluating the Anchor solution to do a free trial, to try it out. Um, and if you just go to anchorworks.com forward slash download, you can either elect to do a trial of the SaaS version of the product or the private cloud version of the product. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a great way to, you know, kick the tires and, and see if this is a solution that um, can help you um, empower collaboration and mobility, meet the vertical, unique vertical needs of your demanding clients, and really just empower uh, collaboration with, uh, for your clients. Excellent. Thank you for that. And, and now let's move on to a little bit of a quick Q&A at the end here. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, let's start with uh, Zachary. Um, he asks, is this exclusively a VAR product for white labeling? Um, actually, I think we answered this, but with VAR provided end user support or MSPs? Or, so either of these products gets, let me start again. Is this exclusively a VAR product for white labeling 
with VAR provided end user support or MSPs. So either of these products get sold with an agent commission model? Yeah, l let me let me try to tackle that. I mean, today yeah. today today Anchor is really not available um, for, in a VAR model. In VAR model meaning eFolder would support it, eFolder would bill it and then pay a VAR commission. We really uh, deploy this product in an MSP fashion. Uh, we sell it on a wholesale basis to the channel partner, and then you decide what your margin is going to be. You decide what the retail price point is going to be. You decide what other additional you know, swizzles you want to put on the product and how you price and package it and take it to market. So it's really an MSP-centric model, not a VAR-centric model. Um, though there's, there's nothing stopping with, you know, there's nothing stopping a VAR from, from from taking the product and packaging it in a more kind of uh, you know, end user independent format where the end, end user IT department is really in the driver's seat. The product is flexible enough to do that and you can just come up with your own pricing and packaging scheme um, if that's the way you wanted to take it to market. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Ted. And uh, just got time for one or two more questions here. What is, and let's ask Eric, what is a what is cloud enabling a server, and why do it? Yeah, so cloud enabling a server, uh, a file server, means that let's say that you've got uh, 10 traditional network shares that are mapped to everyone's computer. You can make those same network shares available publicly without being on, the, on their domain and uh, without having to connect through a VPN. You can configure those shares uh, to synchronize with, uh, with remote uh, computers or devices, and you can give mobile devices like iPhones, Androids, iPads, etc., and Macs uh, access to those same file shares. Great, thanks for that answer. And I got uh, one more for you, Eric. Um, yeah. What are what are the revenue differences between deploying SharePoint for clients and Anchor for clients? We don't actually uh, do uh, SharePoint consulting. We're we're involved in uh, in the uh, requirements definition uh, process with our clients as a part of our. BCIO process, but uh, other than that, uh, there's there's really not a lot of MSP uh, revenue for us if uh, if one of our clients deploys SharePoint. But there there's usually uh, a certain amount amount of tickets uh, that we get every quarter uh, <laughs> where our team gets dragged into something. So uh, it's definitely definitely not uh, uh, not not a, a margin contributor uh, for us as an MSP. Whereas with uh, uh, with the Anchor product. We're uh, delivering something that enhances their current environment's capabilities, and uh, we happen to make uh, you know some nice uh, recurring revenue on the back end. So it's a win for our clients, and it's a win for us. Excellent. Thanks for that, Eric. And yeah. um, I'm just about out of time here uh, for questions today. If we didn't get to your question today, don't worry. We have all of those questions here, and either eFolder or Centrix IT will reach out to you with the answer after today's event. Um, and I want to thank our guests today, uh, Ted Holsey and Eric Rockwell, for joining us and providing such great information. Thank you, Ted. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Eric. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, great job, uh, and uh, and thanks for including me in this. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name again is Jessica Davis, and I want to thank the audience for joining us today. Thanks so much.